On Tuesday, the Canadian Pediatric Society released their position paper on so-called gender-affirming care for transgender adolescents and youth. Among many other things, the paper advocates for the prescription of chemically castrating drugs for adolescents, along with the barbaric medical practice of double mastectomies for adolescent girls. Now, this paper has received remarkably little media attention in Canada, but none of that is surprising because, as you're all well aware, the Canadian legacy media are fully on board with the gospel of so-called gender affirmation. Over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try and walk you through how the three-headed monster of government, education, and the medical profession have worked behind your back to create an impenetrable barrier between you and your child as the state indoctrinates your child with transgender ideology and eventually promotes undergoing harmful and often irreversible medical procedures. Drop a like in the video, stick around for the ratio of the week prize, help us out by subscribing to the True North YouTube channel, and the common question for the episode is this. Do you feel safe putting your children in public schools? Let me know in the comments, and let's get into it. The Canadian Pediatric Society's position paper on gender-affirming care for transgender adolescents is the kind of thing you have to see to believe, not only because of how absurd it is, but because the media won't show you anyways. So we're going to do that right now. We're going to show you exactly what is in this position paper. The paper begins by telling parents that it is their duty to create an environment that doesn't make future assumptions about a child's gender identity. It then goes on to complain that gender identity research has been conducted using cisgender children through a white Eurocentric lens, whatever that means. The paper then goes on to say that close to 1 in 10 school-aged children in Canada reported having gender dysphoria. Oh, but all of that was just the introduction. This is when it starts to get really insane. The paper then goes on to lay out diagnostic criteria for doctors to confirm whether or not a child suffers from gender dysphoria. And take a look at this. As long as a child, in the eyes of the CPS, has what they describe as a marked incongruence with their actual gender versus the gender they express for six months, along with any of the below criteria, a doctor can diagnose that child with gender dysphoria. And for adolescents, again, as long as that adolescent displays a marked incongruence with their actual gender versus the one they are expressing for six months, along with two of the following criteria, a doctor can diagnose gender dysphoria. Once that diagnosis is made, then the trouble really begins. Regardless of whether or not a doctor has diagnosed your child with gender dysphoria, hormone blockers are being prescribed to children who claim that they are transgender. The top recommended hormone blocker for boys and girls, according to the CPS, is a drug called luprolide acetate, otherwise known as Lupron. Among other things that luprolide acetate is prescribed for, Luprolide is given to repeat violent sex offenders as a chemical castration drug. This is the same drug that the CPS is advocating for your children. The CPS encourages the use of luprolide acetate in early onset puberty because doing it early in puberty, as they say, prevents the growth of secondary sex characteristics that make eventually cutting them off much more difficult. According to an American-based physician speaking on the basis of anonymity in the City Journal, these GnRHAs, or hormone blockers like Lupron, shuts down the activity of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is this almond-sized structure in your brain. It's one of the most vestigial structures we have, and it controls all the other hormonal structures in your body. Your sexual development, your emotions, your fight-or-flight response, everything. It's the system that allows you to stand in awe of the beauty of a sunset, or to hear the sounds of orchestral music and to stop whatever you're doing and want to listen. To shut down that system is to shut down what makes us human, this physician says. The next stage in the CPS position paper is advocating for what they call gender-affirming hormones. This is prescribing testosterone or estrogen to girls or boys. As they say in the document itself, both testosterone and estrogen can permanently decrease fertility to an extent that is not yet fully known. They also say that gender-affirming hormones should only be prescribed to adolescents 
with a confirmed case of gender dysphoria or with emphasis on the or gender incongruence who demonstrate the capacity to understand and appreciate both the benefits and risks of these medications. And last but not least, the CPS advocates for gender affirming surgeries, double mastectomy surgeries for little girls. Now that's what doctors are doing. Let's now move to the next head of this three headed monster, schools. We've known for quite some time that school boards and schools have completely fallen off the deep end. They've embraced radical gender ideology and everyone is now starting to pay more attention to it. But a recent 21 page Hamilton Wentworth district school board policy paper on gender identity and gender expression gives us insight into what these schools are doing behind the backs of parents. Among other things, the school board is now telling teachers and administrators that unless they use the preferred pronouns and preferred names of a student, they risk being fired because using the actual name of a student is seen as harassment and discrimination. The policy statement goes on and just like the CPS, it gets progressively worse. Safety is always a key consideration when accommodating a student request. In cases in which students aged four to 12 years of age have requested a name and pronoun be used that correspond to the gender with which they identify and do not have parent or guardian consent, the principal will discuss a safety plan and next steps with the school superintendent. So the school principal and school superintendent will make their own safety plan for a four-year-old child who wants to go by a preferred name and pronoun and not tell the parents. This decision to openly and proudly, it seems, lie to parents about the social transition of their child in schools is flushed out further on in the statement. School staff will utilize the name and pronouns that affirm the student's lived gender identity verbally at the student's request while at school. When communicating with home, the legal name and the pronouns relating to the sex assigned at birth will continue to be used. The information of a child's social transition, a gender transition at school, as they say later on in the statement, will not be disclosed to a parent or guardian unless the student gave explicit consent for it to be shared and or, again, emphasis on the or, the student's safety and well-being are at risk. Who determines whether the student's safety or well-being will be at risk? It makes it seem as though a teacher can decide to withhold the information themselves if they themselves decide that the student's safety is at risk. Truly insane. It's not just in Hamilton. The Kawartha Pine Lakes Ridge District School Board released a memorandum to parents at the beginning of Pride Month telling them the exact same thing. Unless specifically directed by the student, schools must keep a student's trans identity confidential. Therefore, school staff should not disclose a student's gender identity to others unless there is a specific need to know or if the student has given permission to share. This is regardless of age or grade, even in elementary. So that's what the schools are now doing. Now let's take a look at what the government is doing. The only province in Canada to put an end to teachers and school boards actively hiding the social transition, change of name, change of gender pronouns from parents is New Brunswick. Despite other provinces in Canada being run by so-called conservatives like Danielle Smith, Scott Moe and Doug Ford, only New Brunswick, led by Blaine Higgs, has made the decision to end this outrageous policy of teachers withholding the social transition, the gender transition of children from their parents. Now, this is to say nothing at all about the pitiful cowardice and lack of courage displayed by federal conservatives in Ottawa with Pierre Polyev leading the charge. Blaine Higgs, the premier of New Brunswick, has stood firm in his commitment that parents have a right to know when their child undergoes a social transition, uses a different name at school, and uses different gender pronouns. Despite a majority of Canadians, 58%, agreeing with Higgs, so-called conservatives in his own caucus, in his own party, have resigned over Blaine Higgs demanding that parents have a right to know what's going on with their kids. Good riddance to these fake conservatives, anyway. Justin Trudeau weighed into this provincial policy matter and said that they need to stand firm against this decision. Trudeau thinks they need to stand firm against parents wanting to know whether or not their kids are undergoing social transition. Trudeau called Higgs a far-right political actor and called the decision cruel. Despite Justin Trudeau weighing in on the matter, Pierre Polyev, in this cowardly display, decided to say absolutely nothing. 
I'll, I'll let provinces make uh, decisions about their education system. None of that is that surprising, however, because Conservatives, along with every single other member in the House of Commons, voted unanimously to pass Bill C-4 in 2021. Bill C-4 criminalizes a parent for telling their child that actually, no, Tommy, you are a boy, not a girl. And no, Sally, despite your teacher telling you that you are a boy, no, you're in fact a girl. That is criminal now, thanks to Bill C-4. And Conservatives unanimously voted for that bill. Parents, on the other hand, along with the 57% of Canadians who agree with Blaine Higgs, are standing up together, standing shoulder to shoulder, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of religion, demanding an end to gender ideology. Despite whatever politicians who are becoming increasingly indistinguishable, regardless of what side of the house they sit on, have to say about it. If they don't want to stand with the majority of Canadians, fine, so be it. The rest of us, on the other hand, are saying enough is enough. Ratio of the week time, the winner this week is Quebec-based Liberal MP Greg Fergus. Yesterday, MPs stood up for a moment of silence to, quote, commemorate the discovery of the remains of 215 children outside of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. As we all know, no remains outside of Kamloops have been discovered. Nonetheless, every single MP in the House of Commons decided to stand up for a gesture commemorating what is not actually true. Doesn't help any Indigenous Canadians whatsoever. Nonetheless, Greg Fergus decided to take issue with the fact that Pierre Polyev didn't bow his head enough to his liking. How does one not choose to bow one's head in respect for the unmarked graves at the former residential school in Kamloops, as the Speaker of the House asked members to? Look at this ratio, 1,227 replies to only 572 likes at the time of this recording. You know, the problem for Greg here is that it turns out liberals also didn't bow their heads the way Greg would have liked Pierre Polyev to. It's uncomfortable when the facts get in the way of a good political jab, isn't it, Greg? Take a look at these comments. Really, Greg, your little brain thinks this is the most important issue facing Canada right now? Really? Yeah, like whether or not Polyev bows his head for something that actually hasn't been confirmed. Seems like their priorities are nice and squared away. This guy writes, I think you mean soil disturbances. Yep. That's the uncomfortable reality here, isn't it? It was a proven false flag. Also, remember when I think three bands invited Trudeau to celebrate Indigenous People's Day, but instead he had private meetings on his surfboard in Tofino? Oh yeah, that's right. He gave an apology and got away with it. Yeah, what's worse, not bowing your head enough the same way Liberal MPs weren't bowing their heads? Or skipping Truth and Reconciliation Day to go on a little surf vacation in Tofino? I'll let you be the judge of that. Reminder to let me know in the comments, do you feel safe sending your child to public school in Canada? All right, that's gonna do it for us this week on the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Harrison Faulkner, and this is Ratio.